this week's rock star is Pim van Geffen. So Pim's a geo geochemist in Vancouver. So I'm very thankful. It's quite late over there. So thank you so much for talking to us down here. Um, so yeah, he's, Pim's currently working uh, with CSA Global and he'll be chatting with us today about geochemical methods for breaking down barriers. So thank you so, so much for joining. And yeah, over to you. All right. So yes, from silos to synergy, a uh, super uh, cheesy title perhaps, but um, what I would like to talk to you about is uh, to today is um, you know how we can perhaps use a, a little more geochemistry in our lives and uh, and use that to uh, to break break up some barriers, some silos, and and get communicating um, across a broader uh, a broader spectrum than we usually do. So. Um, I put a cautionary statement in there. It's highly promotional. This talk. It's not promotional to what I do as a, as a you know in my daily life a little bit. It's more promotional to the the science of geochemistry, and I hope that many of you will uh, will be encouraged and you know inspired um, after this, and uh, and 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 a bit more you know perhaps open to the idea of 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 using your geochemical skills and and expanding on them. So. Let's see how the forwarding goes. There we go. So first, we look back into history a little bit, and um, you know, we, let's let's start at the beginning where uh, where things first got written up. Um, in the beginning, there was uh, Theophrastus. You may not have heard of him. He was a Greek philosopher. He was in the Aristotelian school, and uh, in about 300 before Christ, he actually uh, wrote a couple of books, a number of books actually. One of them was on stones. And that one uh, survived. And then there was one on mining, which um, unfortunately is, is lost. There, there are references to it. Um, it was probably borrowed by one of his engineering students who uh, never returned it. And then and um, later, uh, there was a Roman guy called uh, Gaius Plinius II, so known as Pliny the Elder. And he published uh, Naturalis Historia, or uh, Natural History. And that included chapters on geology and mineralogy and mining and the references to Euphrastos. So, you know, there's in the classical times, there are these philosophers who know a lot of things, uh, or at least a little bit about a lot of things. And then as we sort of proceed to, through the times, uh, there's of course the Middle Ages in which um, all kinds of things happen, but uh, not, not a lot of breakthroughs in terms of science. Um, until we get to the Renaissance. So there's um, there's Georg Bauer. He is uh, you know, George George the Farmer, really, is his literal name in German. But of course, uh, you know, when you write in Latin, you turn your name into Georges Agricola. So Agricola wrote the Re Metallica, which is actually twelve books on on mining and metallurgy. It's quite comprehensive as well. So he wrote that in what's currently you know, Eastern Germany and the Ore Mountains. And um, I thought one phrase is really good from, from his introduction, where he says a miner should have knowledge of philosophy, medicine, astronomy, surveying, arithmetic, architecture, drawing, and law. Though there are few masters of the whole craft and most are specialists. So already in the Renaissance, um, we had divided our labor and, um, and you know there were more specialists than, than than people who knew the breadth of it all. And then since then, uh, through the Enlightenment and where we are now, uh, our hyper specialization has really put us into very narrow pigeonholes. And yeah, there's few people who 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 have a, a sense of what's going on in the breadth of things, um, but we're also very siloed. So as an industry, we suffer from that. As a science, we suffer from that. You know, scientists, as a society, we suffer from from siloing. So how do we how do we you know get over that um, that, that that inhibition? Um, so you know, while some of the process may be hyper efficient because we are hyper specializing, we also you know everybody just does their little part to contribute to the process. Um, you know, it, there's also some inhibitions that come with that. So I want to take you to Vancouver now. Um, this is uh, the uh, ocean concrete plant in Vancouver. And uh, it's, we're not going to talk about concrete. We're going to talk about those, those beautiful silos. And uh, there were these Brazilian twins came to Vancouver, um, artists, graffiti artists. And they were commissioned to, uh, to paint these silos. 
And I think that these guys actually uh, had some friends in, or family in mining because they perfectly uh, imaged them, the, the people involved there. So these are called the giants. We're installed as part of the Vancouver BNL. Um, and you see the guy here, you know, the first guy is obviously exploration. He's got the plaid, plaid pants, uh, a knapsack. He's ready for the field. Looks like a boy scout a little bit. And then, you know, once you jump from exploration to mining, they don't talk because they look in different directions. And um, you see, yeah, the mining guy, yeah, typical profile. Um, so from exploration to mine, there's already, there's a, there's a big gap usually. And there's all kinds of reasons that the, that the gap exists. Usually it's, it's time, you know, projects get sold, uh, new owners come in uh, 20 years go by. Finally, it, you know, the feasibility works out and it becomes a mine uh, and the explorationists are, are long gone. Uh, apart from the new ones, of course, who do near mine exploration, that's a different story. Now we go to the mill. Um, again, mill guys, you know, if anything, they talk to the mine about, you know, great control uh, and 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 make sure, you know, the, the mill feed is, is consistent. Um, they do look the same way as the metallurgists because, you know, they, they, they work under the same roof. Uh, metallurgists wearing a mask, might be a fighter's mask, but it also be, you know, metallurgical heat shield there. Um, then there's a sales guy looking the other way again. He's got very other, you know, very different priorities, uh, just marketing and, and get, getting the, the product out to, to market. And then there's the, the environmental guy in his, in, his, in, his, um, in his green shirt, and he gets to, uh, you know, figure out what, what messes are made and how to prevent the worst of it. So that's sort of the current situation. And you can also see that it's not not a lot of diversity in this um, in this group of silos either. So we are, as an industry, pretty siloed, and that has you know it, it, it's it's a natural progression, and we see that also in the development of 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 you know the tribes of people uh, going around the globe, developing different languages. So that you know our, our our family tree of languages is depicted here. This is an old world language family, so really Western. Western languages, um, Indo-European languages, that's where, it's, where this one starts and it doesn't include a lot of indigenous languages at all. But you can see how it all branches off and all these, these different languages now branch out and we don't really understand each other anymore unless we decide that we have a trade language such as English and we all, we all learn that to, to at least to communicate. But at some point back in the day, uh, you know, there, it was simpler times and fewer languages and we could all, you know, be together. Similarly, um, you know, our tribes have spread all over the globe, but what we term tribes now is really, you know, we, we're no longer, we think of ourselves as no longer tribal society, but really we are. And here, you know, I'm talking to you in a geo hug. I'm talking to my little tribe of people who understand the geological language. And, you know, so this is all very, very cozy and familiar. So, you know, I really recommend this little book uh, by Seth Godin called Tribes. And it talks about how we self-organize in our little tribes and that anyone in that little tribe can be a leader of that tribe or in that tribe and can, can bring about their, their, their best contributions to the tribe. So, so I really recommend you read that. And as the book itself, it's a small little book, the book itself also suggests pass it on once you've, you've read it, give it to someone else to read. So let's go back to the really basic fundamentals, the things that you know, I think we need to, um, we need to understand to, to make progress in our, in our attempt to you know, reach out and, and uh, break down some of these barriers that exist in the industry. So I like uh, you know, this little slide because you know, we've got the alphabet here. Most people are intimately familiar with that. Some people are intimately familiar with the periodic table uh, but few are fluent in using this kind of language of, of chemistry to really understand both materials and processes. So, you know, when we, we talk about the letters of the alphabet, of course, we understand we can make words with that and with that we can communicate. So with chemistry, you know, we can make minerals and with minerals, we can make rocks and we can talk about geology and, uh, and, and, and mining and exploration, you know, and everything related to it. So these are very similar concepts. And 
I hope to convince you here a little bit that, um, that we can use chemistry or geochemistry as our, as our common language. So let's dive right into that periodic table. Um, if you haven't heard about this yet, uh, I would highly recommend you look this up. Um, the Earth Scientist Periodic Table of the Elements and their Ions. And you know, there's all kinds of really interesting information about each element and about groups of elements in this one, uh, one, one version of the, the periodic table. Uh, so that's at railsback.org. Um, if you haven't, if, if it, if it doesn't, doesn't live on your, uh, uh, on your computer yet, you definitely have to go and download it. So, so let's zoom into a little, little corner of this, this diagram here, this, this, this alternative um, uh, layout of the periodic table. And we get to element mobility. And that's kind of critical in, uh, you know, in all, all the processes that we talk about in, in exploration and mining and, uh, and beyond and environmental processes as well. Um, it really comes down to, to element mobility. So why did I put it this slide? If you can, you can see here uh, on, the, on the left hand side, those are the, the alkaline metals. Um, and then we sort of progress through the periodic table as you would you know, through the middle part, the, the D block elements, and then into the, uh, the non-metals. So what, what are we looking at here is, is the ionic potential changing. What is ionic potential? It's the charge over the radius. So when we have a large radius and a small charge, such as lithium, sodium, uh, potassium, these are the, the alkali metals, um, what happens is that these ions, they're you know, plus one, they surround themselves with, with, with um, water molecules. And because water molecules are, are polar, um, the negative side of it. Um, so this is the, the large oxygen atom. And then you see the little red dots represent hydrogen atoms. So um, the, the water molecule actually is attracted to that positive, large positive ion. And, um, and it's quite happy in solution. So these, these single valent you know, metals um, easily dissolve. Now, when we move over to higher ionic potentials, so we get smaller radii and, and, a, and, a, and a higher charge. Um, now, what, we, what starts to happen is that some of these, some of these uh, uh, protons are actually repelled. So with that, the, the, the molecule or the, the, you know, the, the starts to form an ion that's much less soluble in water. So these actually form hydroxy complexes and, and strong oxides. And when we do form strong oxygen bonds, uh, we form stable solids. Now, if you move over even further and we get to even higher ionic potential, the very high ionic potential plus five plus six charge and very small ions, now we start to form these um, oxyanion complexes. So we repel all the hydrogens from our, uh, from our water molecules. And we end up with things like, like phosphate and sulfate and nitrate which are again quite happy to move around in water uh, surrounding themselves by water molecules, but then uh, of course uh, the, the, the positive side of the polar molecule. So you now this is just some of the fundamentals of why elements are more or less mobile, yes or no. But it all has to do with, uh, with, with some of the systematics that you can find back in the periodic table. So, when we talk about processes, um, you know, it depends if you're an exploration geologist or if you're if you're working in a mine. You know, uh, processing is is very different from processes in the earth. But I, I just listed a number of processes here that are related to that chemistry and uh, where where chemistry really really does play a role in geochemistry in particular related to uh, geological processes. So it's such as the, the formation, you know, or formation. So we have metallogenesis at a very large scale. Any metallogenic province, you know, is there potential for anything to, to, to develop, uh, you know, a mineral deposit? Uh, the geodynamics, uh, the ge geodynamic system that will then, you know, facilitate a mineral system, yes or no? And um, you've probably all seen re recent presentations by uh, John Lonsky and, and, and others about mineral systems. Uh, you know, talking about the large-scale plumbing and the processes that that you know 
uh, that, that are required to actually bring about an ore deposit. And of course, we have magmatic processes, hydrothermal processes, structure, alteration, mineralization, and oxidation. All these, these are all part of the, 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 the mineral deposit and its formation. Now, when we go over to mining, uh, of course, we're talking about extraction processes. So mining, blasting, excavation, convolution, metallurgy, waste and tailings. Um, you know, these are all processes that are where, again, chemistry is involved in the dis dis descriptions of the material, as well as, you know, how do we go about breaking it apart? How do we go about, you know, what, what chemistry do we need for blasting, excavation, uh, comminution? You know, those may be a little bit, you know, another step removed from the geochemical parameters that we're talking about. But again, all these different processes involved in the extraction of our of, of our metals, of our ore, um, you know, in relate in some way again to 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 to, to processes that can be uh, reduced also also to chemistry. And then there's business processes. You know, in all these business processes that you know they involve business decisions based on our knowledge of the composition and uh, and, and processes uh, related related to that. So we have an exploration business, for instance, we try to find and replace our, our resources. Then QA and QC, um, this is a big part of the business process that is often ignored or done too late for people who uh, are uh, you know, um, responsible for this part early in the process don't realize the real value of this. So QA, QC has everything to do with risk, right? So risk definition, understanding the, the, the geological risk and the geochemical risk and the the, the very, um, and that translates directly to financial risk. So if you don't understand what the quality of your data is, uh, then you don't understand what, what financial risk you run in the development of a, of a deposit. So extremely important uh, that you understand this. If you don't understand it, hire someone who does. It's, it's critical. Uh, then we go into resource and reserve estimation. Of course, there's other risks involved there economic studies. And again, we try to incorporate all the knowledge we have about you know, risk and reduce the risk uh, and, and produce as much value as we can at, at the minimum risk. Um, and all these, thing, all these things, these business processes are related to that. So they all build on that early information. Critical. So yeah, make sure that you get the right people who understand all those processes in, you know, involved in your, uh, in your operation. So this might seem a little bit, you know, too broad and too too far fetched, but I'm just pointing out here that there's there's a lot going on that you know we if we communicate the right information, uh, we can really we can really you know take a lot of advantage of um, of our understanding of processes as well as materials. Of course, materials are made up of you know the materials that we deal with, made up of minerals, which are made up of of, of elements. Uh, in which geochemistry comes to play. I'll explain later what this image is about. So let's jump to um, what I talked about in the abstract as well. It's the, 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 the theme of ore body knowledge. And that's an old theme. It's been, you know, it, it, at least, you know, the theme is old, but the, 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 the term might be relatively new to some. So, you know, I'm, I'm aware that some companies have been using this for a long time. Uh, but it's really come to the fore uh, in the last 10 years or so uh, alongside geometallurgy. So you may hear geomet, geometallurgy, or ore body knowledge used interchangeably. I think ore body, or body knowledge is a bit more comprehensive view on, um, on, on, on the same sort of, um, thematic concept. So lithology chemistry historically is mostly applied in exploration and then um, once you know um, the deposit is defined and it's found and 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 characterized and and you know we've we've drilled it out and we've given it all to the resource uh, estimators and the developers now that's not generally not really revisited anymore except for you know the, again uh, brownfields exploration where we where we still move about in this in this area. Um, however, a lot of this can be and should be communicated to operations. So here's um, a definition of ore body knowledge as, as uh, Brim uses it. So 
Brim is the Bradshaw Research Initiative for, for Minerals and Mining at UBC. It's, it's pretty new. Um, it was initiated a couple of, a couple of years ago. And they, uh, they summarized it very well. So I'm just borrowing their, their summary of the theme of orbital knowledge. Where they say orbital knowledge focuses on the integration of geological, mining, metallurgical, environmental, and economic information to create geologically based predictive models for mineral exploitation. These models can then feed into maximizing the value of mineral recovery efforts, efforts while minimizing technical and operational risk, critical uh, energy and water usage and tailings production. So and then they go on to say, we adopt a rocks first based definition of geometallurgy that covers the whole of the mining value chain and includes exploration, mining, processing and recovery, waste streams, environmental impacts, economics and social acceptance. So there's that ESG concept again, um, you know, environment and social acceptance are, are, are integral part of what we do these days. Um, so, okay, how do, we, how do we expand on this? How do we make sure that we communicate all the relevant information to each other? So this is sort of traditionally the realm of economic geology and um, even at you know all our economic geology conferences we talk about finding finding resources we don't talk a lot about you know what's next so of course you know we've got boots on the ground we use our, our tools our compasses we apply some geophysics we map uh, we do some geochemistry surface geochemistry downhole geochemistry you know get a rig get a get a couple of holes in the ground um, analyze our data, we get it to some economic study, and then we so we give it to whoever comes next, right? So that's that's our world. If you are steeped in, in exploration, um, you know, in economic geology, geochemistry, uh, you know, this is sort of this is sort of the, where the world ends, and then you know someone someone else can deal with it. So what I hope to conveys that you know today but um, that I try to get everybody thinking about and I've been on this high horse before so apologies if you've seen this before um, but you know I think we should first bridge this gap so this is really geometallurgy is bridging the gap between exploration development and production so operations exploration and operation so using all the knowledge acquired during the exploration phase Resource model and the mine plan can be based on many more value modifying parameters and only grade and tonnage, um, so that each block in the model can be assigned a more accurate value, and operational risk can be quantified and minimized. So this is this is the the concept of geometallurgy, the classical geomet. And when we talk about ore body knowledge, this is really I think where we where we should be going, and a few. Few groups are doing this, but this is really critical that we do go here. I think it's imperative that we do as an industry. There's so much room for improvement. So if we really think in our exploration efforts about what's coming next, you know, in terms of development and production, but also in terms of regeneration, what's going to be required at the end of the line? What is even required now to get a permit going, right? So even at the, the, the permitting phase actually belongs right here. Um, you should be thinking about that while you're exploring um, and all the requirements. So you, you, we both, you know, we need to convey the information that we, that, we, that we get in the exploration stage to whoever comes after us, but we also need to understand their language and make sure that we, you know, collect the right data for them to be useful down the, down the downstream. So ideally we would all adopt a little bit of this holistic thinking and uh, you know, think about our body knowledge for project optimization instead of ending up here, which is unfortunately still um, you know, happens all too, too often, right? So communicate. So we have to communicate. We have to communicate between the silos, break them down and see what we can do. And I'll just show you part of a little case study now um, related to uh, the high grade Bruce Jack gold and silver deposit in, in, in BC. So this is British Columbia. For those um, on the call, I'm guessing most of you are, are, are in Australia and are Australian. 
you may or may not have heard of this particular deposit. Um, it was uh, brought online very quickly after discovery. It only took seven years to, uh, to go from discovery to, uh, to, to first production. And um, of course, a very high grade system comes with its own challenges. So here we are in uh, Northwest BC. We're about 60 kilometers north of, of Stewart near the Alaska Panhandle. This is Alaska here. And uh, we're just, just still in, in British Columbia. And you can see we're pretty high, high up in the mountains, um, not a lot of greenery, uh, snow cover half the year. And, uh, and so this is a new, the new mill uh, infrastructure. And you see the added here where uh, you know, the, the conveyor runs uh, all covered for winter conditions into the, into the, the plant. So this um, work that I did here is actually a few years ago already that I completed that, um, but it included a data set of uh, 250,000 um, assay values of, uh, of, of about a thousand drill holes. And when you have four acid digest for those, you get multi-element uh, geochemistry. You can actually do a lot with that kind of data. So here, I'm just going to run you through very quickly. I've got some extra slides in the back in case people are really interested. Um, but really quickly, so the, the approach. So we first, we start with you know, classifying materials. So rock types based on immobile elements. Um, you, know, you can see here with the data density overlay that there's, there's, there's a bunch of different groups that split out already. Then we go through a stepwise process, uh, reprojections of the data in multivariate space and do some some, some, some multivariate analysis on, on the whole data set. And we end up with, um, with the lithogeochemical classification. This was really critical for them because um, they, their logging hadn't even kept up with all the high uh, density drilling. And uh, they were in the process of relogging, but the relogging set them, yeah, there was just no way that their team could keep up and bring everything in a consistent, logging scheme. So they relied actually on this work to help put things in context. And you can see here, when you have this kind of density of drilling, um, you can, from the geochemistry, even infer structure. So this structure was mapped here, the, the, late, the late thrust fault runs through. But um, a lot of this, you know, sort of half graben structure with this, this growth fault um, wasn't really mapped from the surface uh, even during drilling because they didn't actually do any, any oriented core or detailed structural uh, measurements. But from the chemistry, you can still tease out a lot of the, the, the structure. And you see here in brown sort of the conglomerates, the sediments. Then we get some volcanic plastics here. The, the, the first layer is strongly silicified. And then further up, we get, we get these latite flows, um, then, uh, you know, volcanic flows. Uh, you see here that these beds are much thicker um, um, in the hanging wall than they are in the foot wall. So this is this this fault was active um, during you know uh, the volcanic activity and the position. So we know from the area. Um, so now we you know we've classified our, our rock types. We labeled them according to uh, what was mapped, and we know from the area that there's there's really strong uh, phyllic alteration. So Sericite, uh, QSP, port sericite pyrite alteration, phyllic alteration, really pervasive throughout the, the project area. And um, so most rocks are strongly affected by it. And if you then you know, come up with a sericite index, one of the, one of the you know, typical um, expression indices you might use to classify alteration, uh, you see that, yeah, sure, there's, there's all kinds of high sericite running through the system, but in the heart of it, it actually doesn't really show up. So there's another process going on. So what we realize is that there is actually a late stage um, removal of alkalis. So what, happened, what happens then is that, you know, you, you started here from fresh alkali feldspar. This is a, a Pearson rate ratio diagram of potassium and sodium over titanium against aluminum over titanium. So on the line one to one, that's where the fresh alkali feldspars were plot. Uh, you can see here that everything is pretty much gone to, to, to um, sericite, sericite like compositions. And when we go from that sericite and we, we remove a little bit, so in the later stage, we remove a little bit of that potassium and sodium, um, we, you know, towards that, towards the clay minerals. Um, when we 
project that in space, we see that there's a really strong bullseye on both uh, both both the posits in the system here. The, 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 this is the Valley of the Kings, a BOK, and then the West Zone. And um, so so this you know this index was derived based on based on this 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 research uh, helped us focus much much better on what's really going on within the system. And then when you look at depth, um, they actually drilled down in the in the, the southeast here uh, to find a porphyry related uh, mineralization as well. So that's you know okay now we've, we've characterized our rock types, our uh, our alteration system, and 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 the processes involved with with that. Um, let's look at our mineralization. So um, we have very high gold grades, as I mentioned before, but not all of the gold is 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 in in electrum, which is the the main phase. There, makes a mixture of, of uh, gold and silver. Uh, some of it's also in sulfides. And this is not a very clear trend here. So the one-to-one -one, uh, gold to pyrite, this is calculated modal pyrite, um, is, is not a very strong relationship. But when you look at it in space, you see here that this is the heart of the system. And you can see how high grade it is because of only, you know, in yellow and all the, all the hits of five grams of, of gold. Um, and in, in, in orange, uh, the, the modal pyrite over 12%. And you see that there's sort of a ring structure almost around the, um, the, the high grade zone of the Valley of the Kings. And if you look, when you look at it in, uh, in, pro, in long section here, you see that that really sits right above the system and it's definitely related to it. It's just not a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, but the, the thing, the important bit here is that, you know, this high grade gold, um, free gold as electrum uh, versus uh, what's in the sulfides, nearly half of the gold that's produced at Bruce Jack is actually coming from the sulfide. So the gold department here is a, is, is a critical bit that for, uh, for processing and recovery is, uh, is, is necessary to understand. So in summary, um, we can use lithology chemical data analysis to help validate and update lithological classifications. Um, rock mass characterization, including rock types, stratigraphy, structures, alteration, mineralogy, were successfully inferred from the assay data. And then importantly, you know, to you have to put this thing in 3D context. You have to put it in geological, geographical space. Otherwise, you're just doing chemistry, you know, geochemistry. Um, and then, of course, that translates to geological processes that we need to understand. So understanding the host rocks, the gold department, and the gang mineralogy allows then for domaining of the deposit based on contained value and processing requirements. So that's that's an important that's the important bit that we you know not always get to when we are just concerned with uh, you know finding an ore deposit. So such a spatial domain model can then be converted into a one D time domain mine plan, uh, which is then based on the value per block rather than just grade. So that's where we you know that's our goal. That's what we try to to accomplish, and then we can factor in anything uh, related to the processing. So also, uh, you know, uh, uh, things related to uh, to environmental considerations, waste characterization, etc. Okay, so to this photo here, uh, for those of you interested, this vein here is quartz vein. It's about ten centimeters wide, and it runs across these volcanoclastic sediments that contain some pyrite. So in the wall rock, you see the pyrite, and where this vein, this, this, this portrait material comes in, it drops out its electrum right at the intersection of the pyrite. So the concept now is that this is a dielectric effect and that so the gold's brought up in, in a, as colloidal gold pretty much. And it concentrates there where this dielectric effect of the wall rock, uh, the, the pyrite seen in the wall rock actually make it drop out. Uh, so I'd refer to, um, Duncan McLeish's PhD work here to, uh, to read up on that. This is really interesting new research. So you know, back to Geomet and, and how this translates you know, into what we, what we are familiar with here, the geological side of things, uh, to the metallurgy and processes. Um, what we are talking about 
is, is, is really value modifiers, right? It's one thing to just to, to assess the grade and its distribution and, and see whether you have a, you know, any economic values there. But you know, to do a proper economic study, you should really uh, think about all, the, um, all those parameters. So on the left here, we've got geological attributes. And I put some tie lines here to processes on the metallurgical side that are affected by these attributes. So sure, you know, we can, this is all pretty straightforward. Mineralogy does affect comminution and the grade does affect the recovery. Um, and, you know, our other compositions have an effect on, uh, on, on you know, uh, metal leaching and acid rock drainage, for instance, uh, refining and regeneration. So, you know, here's different concepts here. Throughput, time are much more critical. Uh, whereas here on the on the on the left hand side, we're really talking about geological attributes that um, you know we don't always put them in that context of um, you know what's the what are the engineering requirements, the processing requirements related to the material that we've just found. So how do we quantify these processes? How do we quantify how much this affects that? Well, a lot of these geological attributes can be quantified using geochemical. Uh, methods using assay data. So, you know, in, in dark blue, the first order uh, quantification can be done on, you know, on, on whatever is listed here in, in, in dark blue. We can measure these things directly. And then based on our assay data, we can also derive, so we can, we can, we can assess uh, things like mineralogy, so clay content, talc content, alteration, etc. So we can derive those from our first pass measurements. And then based on mineralogy, we can say something about grindability of hardness. And uh, as you saw before in the, in the, in the Bruce Jack uh, case study, uh, even structures can be, can be uh, you know, if you have sufficient uh, information, can be, can be inferred from that. So a lot of this comes back to chemistry again as the, as the connector between the, the two ends uh, of the process. So why should we care about this? Uh, it's not just for the fun of it. It's it's really you know it comes down to economics and 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 financial risks. So originally you know we may have been doing this kind of work where we just define a system based on grade and tonnage and whether it's economic. Uh, then we build a mine and a plant and we push it through, and then we end up with product and waste, and we may or may not uh, be profitable at the end. So our the true risk involved here is usually not well defined. And the true value is unknown really until it's sold. So ideally, we would move to an approach where we understand our system well, so well, well enough, so that we can really optimize the process even before we build plant. And we can then operate at maximum value, value at, at minimum risk. So we get a much better idea of whether our projects are truly feasible in the long run. So that's, um, so that's the premise. So what we try to do here is, you know, we take these silos and we want to turn them into communicating vessels. So you can see here, we don't have to break them out we down. We don't have to smash them down. We don't have to, you know, rip them apart. We just have to make sure that they communicate so that, you know, all the levels are, uh, are equated and the pressure is, uh, is distributed across all departments. So, you know, I, I hope that in this quick half hour, I managed to convince at least some of you that, uh, you know, that, that, Geochemistry and geochemical parameters can really help establishing the links between these different departments. So, you know, in short, we sent out before, but you know, when we talk about materials or processes um, in, in, in mineral exploration, mining, and, and, and uh, you know, at the end also closure and regeneration, we talk about a lot of these processes and materials, we talk about chemistry. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and I hope you all come off mute and uh, barrage me with, with questions and comments. And thank you so much for your time today, Pim. Really, really appreciate that. That was fun. Thanks for inviting me.